Anybody grateful for the presence of the Lord? Come on, I feel the presence of the Lord in the room. And grateful for it. An awesome church to be a part of. Come on, who loves their church? Who loves church? If I lived in Iowa, this is the church I'd go to. So you've made a smart decision uh, by living in Iowa and going to this church. So, uh, man, this, uh, the crowd tonight, uh, this is beautiful. Uh, I think there are probably four, maybe five generations of people in the room tonight. And I think that's a reason that we should clap our hands because there's a lot of churches that don't look like this. Come on. It's a lot of wisdom in the room, a lot of energy in the room, uh, a lot of life in the room. And, uh, and the Holy Ghost is in the room. So uh, I'm super excited. And uh, man, I think Pastor Weaver's in the room. Pastor Weaver, we love you. Come on, anybody love Pastor Weaver? And I think I see Pastor Jeff in the room. Come on, Pastor Jeff, we love you. Austin and Pastor Brian and Luke and Zach and August and everybody. It's a awesome church with some awesome leaders and some awesome pastors. And uh, none of this would actually be possible without leaders that, that love you and leaders that care and leaders that want to make room for, for the emphasis of your spiritual growth and your spiritual life. So I'm excited. Come on, who's got a Bible tonight? Who's got a Bible tonight? If you got your Bible, uh, you're going to need it a lot. I'm going to go to a lot of pastors of scripture. Who was here yesterday? Come on, who was here last night? Who was here yesterday? Okay, good amount of hands. We are going to continue uh, where we left off yesterday, okay? We're going to continue where we left off yesterday. If you weren't in the room yesterday, uh, I gave an analogy that everybody really needs to understand. Uh, the analogy, I told a story uh, of a time where I had an old uh, MacBook, okay? An old MacBook, and I kept doing the software updates, and finally I hit uh, yes on a software update, and, and my MacBook said, uh-uh, not today, Took my MacBook to the Apple store, talked to a uh, Apple genius, and they told me uh, that I could not update the software uh, because the hardware was too old. And we use that analogy to talk about your thoughts versus your, your mind. Come on, all right. Your thoughts versus your in the same way that an old computer can't get new software, we understand that the mind of Adam cannot get biblical thoughts. Okay? The mind of Adam, the mind that me and you were born in, a depraved mind, a retrobet mind, that, that mind cannot actually uh, produce on its own the proper thoughts. And sometimes uh, we spend a lot of time in church trying to teach you new thoughts but we can't teach you new thoughts. We actually need you to adopt a new mind, a whole new mind. And so the Christian life is all about journeying from the mind of, to the mind of Christ. From the mind of, to the mind of, I'm not simply trying to think new thoughts. I'm not trying to go from anxious thoughts to peaceful thoughts. I'm actually trying to go from the mind of Adam to the mind of Christ. Because the mind of Adam will always produce jealous thoughts. The mind of Adam will always produce insecure thoughts. The mind of Adam will always produce self-sabotaging thoughts. But the mind of Christ will always produce thoughts that trust God, believe God, that assume that God knows better than me. Come on, the Bible says what? Your ways are higher than my ways. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts and we want to begin to develop the mind of Christ and put away the mind of Adam and so we don't simply want new thoughts come on we want a whole new mind now biblically the picture that I think illustrates this perfectly is Jesus says this you can't put new wine into old wine skins right uh it, new wine has to go into what? New wine skins. So if you want new thoughts, you need a new mind. Old thoughts for your old mind, new thoughts for your new mind. I want to uh, read a, a confession of uh, faith that, that I wrote years ago because I had teenagers in my youth group that battled with their thoughts. And uh, I believe that you overcome any mental instability, any mental block, not by uh, self-help, not by figuring out how to think positive, but by uh, memorizing the word of God 
in declaring the word of God over your life. Uh, the way that we move from the mind of Adam to the, mi to the mind of Christ is by allowing the Bible to become the, de the new default setting for how we think. Uh, so I'm going to read this to you, and I'm going to give it away to somebody. We'll see. And I've got a bunch of these at the table. Okay, here we go. Whatever is true, I want you to, and I, got, I had teenagers in my youth group. Uh, they would take sticky tack and, like, put these on their mirror in their bathroom and confess this out loud every single day, okay? Uh, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy is what I will set my mind to dwell on today. That's a good confession. When Paul writes that, here's what he's saying, that you're not supposed to have a passive uh, relationship with your mind, but you're supposed to have a what? Active relationship with your mind. Your thoughts don't take you captive. You take your thoughts captive. My mind has been cleansed with the water of God's word, and I'm brainwashed with the blood of Jesus. I need somebody to say amen to that. Amen. My mind does not belong to the enemy or to negativity, but is an instrument of righteousness that belongs to God. I have the mind of Christ. I will not be depressed over the memories of my past nor will I be anxious over the worries of the future. It is my right as a child of God to walk in his joy and in his peace. I have the power to take every thought. I have been transformed by the renewing of my mind. Can I teach you a little something? The, the word uh, in the Bible for repentance, I don't know if anybody knows the Greek word uh, in the original language uh, for repentance. It's a Greek word. Uh, by the name of metanoia. Everybody say metanoia. <laughs> metanoia. Uh, like meta, li like the company that owns Facebook. Meta, like metamorphosis. Uh, it means what? Change. And then noia is where we get the word knowledge. So the word repent means to change your mind. To change your mind. To dictate, to begin to decide that the mind of Adam that is natural to me, the, the mind of Adam that is antithetical to trusting God, the mind of Adam that tells me to trust myself, the mind of Adam that, that is the root of human pride. Come on. Pride. It's pride that tells you that you're probably right, not God. It's pride that says that your opinion should be on the throne of your life. It's pride that says, despite whatever God's word says or whatever God's law says, I think I know better. To change your mind doesn't just mean to change your thoughts, but it means to completely reject the mind of Adam and to embrace the mind of Christ. Here we go. Uh, God has not given me a spirit of, but of power, love, and a what? Sound mind. I have the mind of Christ. I'm brainwashed. That's a confession card, and it's got a wristband. Who needs that? Who needs that? Come on, I saw your hand first. There you go. All yours. What's your name? Yenny? Clap it up for Yenny. All right. Not a lot of time, but, but a lot of to talk about. I always got more sermon than time. Come on, let's do this. You ready? You're ready. All right, there we go. I got one person ready. Come on. You ready? Come on, come on, come on. We got five mindsets that we have to change. Five mindsets that we have to change. We're not just trying to change our... We're not just trying to change our... We're trying to change our... We're not just trying to change our... We're trying to change our... So that means there are five mindsets that we have to change. Last night we covered the first mindset, which is, which is uh, the mind of Christ is always a mindset of trust. Where you begin to say, God, I trust you. Not a mind of understanding, but a mind of trust. Because real trust kicks in when understanding stops. When you can begin to say, God, I don't understand what you're doing or how you're doing things, but I trust you. My human mind does not comprehend why you would make me go through pain or why you put me in a difficult circumstance. My human mind doesn't comprehend. But I what? Trust. Uh-oh. 
teenagers, come on. All the youth in the room, reserve for youth. Okay, if you're a young person, make some noise. The world that we live in communicates that God can't be trusted. Who is God to say that one, per, one man can't love another man and be married forever? Who's God to say that one woman can't love another woman and be married forever? No, but we believe, no, if God said it's wrong, then that just means it's wrong. And we're not trying to get you to understand. The goal is not to understand. That's where your generation gets tripped up. Because y'all say things like, but I just don't understand. Nobody asked you to understand. <laughs> no one said, no one said, hey, you're off the hook for obeying until you understand. God does not say that. God says, no, no, actually, your understanding is not a requirement. The only requirement for obedience is this, trust. God, I trust you. Do I comprehend? No, nah, not really. I'm going to step on your toes. We think we should be able to pick our own pronouns. <laughs> God says, I picked your pronouns for you. I knit you together in your mother's womb. You're not an accident. You're not a mistake. I gave you your nose, your eyes, and all of your body parts. I already did that for you, but I don't feel like the gender I am. No one asks you whether or not you need to understand. Uh-oh. If we make the requirement understanding, there will always be human logic to talk me out of what God is telling me to do. But I don't make enough money to tithe. No one asks you to understand. See, now I'm going to get on the adults. Yeah. <laughs> All the young people are like, yeah. yeah. The, the, the test for whether or not I obey is not whether or not it makes sense to my math. Because you could look at them and go, why would you want to pick your own pronouns? But they could look at you and go, but you pull out your calculator every time God says 10%. Uh-oh. It doesn't matter what generation we're from. All of us want to understand before we obey. And God begins to go, here's the, now here's, here's the curveball. You want to know what typically happens once you obey? God gives understanding. <sighs> understanding doesn't come prior to obedience. Understanding actually increases what? After obedience, the mind of Adam trusts itself. The mind of Christ says, God, not my will, but what? Your will be done. Jesus is trying to figure out, now can we do this without me being crucified? He says, I'm not going to spend my time in this garden trying to understand, but I'm going to Trust. If Jesus had to trust, you're going to have to trust. Come on. The second mindset that we need to change, the second mindset, what we move from a, the mind of Adam to the mind of Christ, we are adopting a faith mindset. A faith mindset. So first is trust. Second is faith. First is trust. Second is faith. Very hard to have faith when there's no trust. Faith without trust is just human optimism. We're not in church to make you more optimistic. We have a whole lot of unsaved people who are optimistic. We don't need you to be optimistic. We need you to have faith. Faith. Now, what is the root of faith? It's this belief that the invisible moves the visible. And a mindset of trust says this, I can't trust my opinion. That's what the mindset of trust says. I can't trust my opinion. I need God's opinion. Here's what the mindset of faith says. I can't trust my eyes. I cannot trust my eyes because all my eyes know is what's visibly in front of me. 
I want to I want to take you to I think it's 2 Kings. Do we have a slide for 2 Kings? 2 Kings chapter 6 verse 17, amazing story. Elisha is surrounded uh, by uh, by an army. Uh, actually, what's happening is Elisha is a prophet, and because of his prophetic ability, he's being able to know exactly where the opposing army is going to be, and he begins to give those uh, inside information to the king of Israel. In every single battle, they end up winning, and, and actually, the opposing army of the opposing king believes there must be a rat, like there must be somebody in our camp telling secrets, you know, but really it's just Elisha using his prophetic gift. So he finds out where Elisha is. He finds out that the problem is not a mole, but the problem is a prophet. Sends an army to the city that the prophet is in. The servant sees the army before Elijah sees it, and the servant is scared, anxious, and nervous. Goes to Elisha, says, Elisha, we got a problem. We're going to die. The army has surrounded us. And here's what Elisha says. Elisha is cool, calm, and collected. And Elisha has these words. He says, open his eyes, Lord, that he may see. You want to know what faith does? It opens your eye so that you can actually see. And what happens? Then the Lord opened the servants, and he, and he, the hills full of horses and chariots of what? A fire. That when we sing that song, you know the song, I'm surrounded. It may feel like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Everybody knows that song, right? You know that song is from this passage of scripture. You get, some, someone's like, oh, there we go. Yeah, we sing in Bible. <laughs> it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by what? You. So, the servant, all the servant could see was the physical horses and the physical chariots. Elisha wasn't freaked out because Elisha didn't just see what was there in the physical. Elisha also saw what was there in the spiritual. Do you want to know the key to overcoming anxiety? The key to overcoming anxiety is not more peace. The key to overcoming anxiety is faith. Because one person in this scenario is freaked out and anxious, and the other person is very calm. And the calm person can see what the anxious person cannot see. Are you distracted by life's problems? Unable to see that the forces of God are actually surrounding all of the forces of wickedness and darkness in your life. You want to know what I need you to see? I need you to get a prophetic vision of your future because that creates peace. Can, can we keep talking about anxiety a little bit? Yeah. There's 18 of you that think yes. Okay. Yeah. You sure? I'm going to step on your toes a little. Okay, she's, you're like, you've already done that. Too late. Here we go. Here we go. Are you sure you're ready? Yeah. Come on, who can be honest in church? I battle with anxious thoughts. Come on, battle with anxious thoughts. Here we go. Uh, God's solution for anxiety is not peace. When I was a youth pastor, Luke, I, I used to pray for teenagers who were anxious that God's peace would rest in their life. And I'd pray for peace and pray for peace and pray for peace. The only problem is they would get peace at the altar and they would leave and they couldn't keep the peace. And they need to come back next week and I need to fill them a new prescription with more peace. And they'd run out of peace and they'd come back and it, it just, it was a vicious cycle. And then I realized that in Genesis chapter 1, God gives us a solution for anxiety. That anxiety is actually chaos. And God does not put his peace on the chaos in Genesis chapter 1. The Bible says that in the beginning, uh, God created what? The heavens and the earth. And the earth was what? Formless and void. In Hebrew, that means tohu vavohu. Come on, everybody say tohu. tohu. Vavohu. Vavohu. It means uninhabitable. It means chaotic. It means anxious. It means something that's not conducive to human thriving. And God then, it says that the spirit of God, what? Hovered over the surface of the deep. And you want to know what God starts to do? 
There we go. One person wants to know. There we go. <laughs> Y'all was real black on Sunday. Y'all have gotten <laughs> progressively vanilla. Come on. <laughs> Talk to me. <laughs> the Hebrew word bara, for, that's the word for create, actually doesn't appear that much in Genesis chapter 1. Because God doesn't do that much creating. You want to know what he does? Separating. Organizing. And ordering. You want to know God's solution for chaos? It's not peace. You want to know what it is? Order. Order. If you want peace, peace can only exist when God's order is accepted in your life. Order is the solution for anxiety. So, uh-oh, there's an order to life. Everybody say order. There's an order to life. Everybody say order. Here's the order. Sex comes after marriage. That's the order. So I had teenagers, not y'all, y'all are perfect. I had teenagers in my youth group that reversed the order. They put sex before marriage. You want to know what it made them? Anxious. Because whenever we reject God's order, chaos explodes in our life. So now you're supposed to be focused on math and you're wondering who he texting. Uh-oh. Because sex makes you possessive. Sex makes you believe that that person belongs to you. So now when they start talking to somebody else, you get jealous. And the only realm that jealousy is supposed to live in is marriage. That's why sex comes after marriage, not before. You defy God's order and chaos breaks out in your life. Uh-oh. I'm preaching better than y'all are responding. I'm helping you. <laughs> you can't ask God's peace to descend on your chaos. God, please give me your peace. Please. I just need peace. Please. Meanwhile... Your life is chaotic, in rebellion, you disobey God, and you reject God's what? Order. Okay, can we keep going? Yes. Come on. The Bible says that Jesus is our prince of peace. Come on, prince of peace. I don't get his peace until he's my prince. If I make my boyfriend my prince then that means he's now responsible for my peace. Uh-oh. If my employer is my prince, then that means my employer is responsible for my peace. I cannot put something that's not God as a Lord in my life and function in idolatry and expect that I can demand that his peace reign in my life. I don't get his peace until I accept his order. His rule, his authority, his government, his what? Kingdom. kingdom. Boom. You are spot on. His kingdom. When I enter into his kingdom, what am I admitting? That he's king. Not me. Can we keep going? Yes. Come on. Because God's solution to what? Anxiety is not peace. It's what? Order. Order, order, that's why there's order in church. Hello. Any environment that God wants there to be peace, he what, establishes order. That's why there's order to a family. Paul's real clear, hey, homeboy, you the leader. Wife, you number two. Kids, y'all obey, order. Here's when anxiety breaks out. Uh-oh. When parents can't get along, now you got a single mom who's stressed out about the rent you're being paid and tells a 13-year-old about a problem that's not the kind of problem that a 13-year-old can handle. An order has been broken, and now the weight that is supposed to be on a dad falls on a 13-year-old boy. And now we're shocked when that 13-year-old is anxious. You're anxious because you need to be a kid. Yeah. 
And we got a lot of parents who think they're friends with their kids. Not your friend. That's a child. And if you tell a child about an adult problem, you cannot be all that shocked when a lack of order results in anxiety in your 13-year-old. Your 13-year-old is a baby. You don't tell babies about adult problems. And here we go. And babies stay babies. Because the enemy is in a rush to rob you of your innocence. And the reason the enemy wants to rob you of your innocence is so that chaos will break out in your life. And God puts parameters in place to keep you safe, not to hold anything back from you. And you'll never believe that until you first, come on, move into the mindset of trust. If I trust, then that means I don't question any of his rules. Like my kid, my 10-month-old. My 10-month-old cannot understand. He can understand, like, bye. And he does this. It's very cute. But I can't sit down with my 10-month-old and explain to him why sucking his fingers and then putting them in the electrical socket is a bad idea. <laughs> he does not comprehend. So you want to know what I do as a parent? I get them little inserts. And it's my job to protect him because he cannot understand. Do you want to know why God has placed certain things off limits? He's not going to come down and, and explain everything to you. Because your brain is a thimble. He's the ocean. Trying to explain to you why whatever issue society says is okay is actually not okay is not the most loving thing for him to do. The most loving thing for him to do is to put safeguards in place to protect you from yourself. Come on. A mindset of trust. Number two, a mindset of faith. Some of us think, well, God, if you just showed me some evidence, it would be easier for me to have faith. No, that is a lie. Can I help you? Lucifer saw everything. Was an archangel in heaven. Probably witnessed creation. Witness God do all kinds of things. Lucifer still did not trust even though he had seen. Seeing is not believing. If you always need to see in order to believe, Jesus calls you an unbelieving generation that demands a sign. A mindset of faith says this. The invisible is always impacting. The invisible is always impacting the visible. And all of us have faith. Every single last one of us. You, I know you got faith. You know why? Who's ever used Wi-Fi? That's faith in action. Come on, raise your hand if you've ever seen Wi-Fi. No. Totally invisible. But guess what it does? Controls everything around you. Some of us can't even drive without a GPS. Controls everything. You've never seen a cell phone signal in your life. You just see the evidence of it. The invisible always impacts the visible. All right, mindset number three. We're doing good for time. Okay, come on. You learning anything? Yeah. You learning something? Yes. Good. Mindset number three is what? An abundance mindset. An abundance mindset. What's the opposite of an abundance mindset? A scarcity mindset. I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, and this individual is not here or around me, so it's okay. Jayon, don't tell him I told him this story. I'm not even going to say his name. I was at my church. Now, I go to a black church, okay? Everybody say black church. I go to a black church, all right? Uh, it's, it's about, there's about as many white folks at my church as there are black folks in this church. Like, it's just <laughs> totally flip-flopped, all right? I go to a black church. And... Um, one time I was at church, and I was talking to a black guy. He's an entrepreneur, and uh, this is a great guy, but he said something rather racist. He said something not only racist, he said something that was ignorant, and I had to check him. 
And he said, he was talking about a group of people, an immigrant population in our country, and he said, yeah, they're taking our jobs. And I said, huh? That's a scarcity mindset. Not only is that racist, but that's a scarcity mindset. What do you mean they're taking our jobs? As if there's a limited amount of jobs. So you believe that there's a limited amount of anything? The Bible that I read says that God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. The Bible that I read says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. You are stuck in a scarcity mindset if you think that anybody can take something that God has for you. An abundance mindset says this, there's more than enough. There are more than enough wives to go around for everybody. There's more than enough husbands to go around for everybody. There's more than enough opportunity to go around for everybody. There's more than enough wealth to go around for everybody. And I'm not competing with anyone for what God has for me. Scarcity mindset. He was very upset. He was offended, you know what I'm saying? He didn't leave the church. It was okay. But I was like, they're taking our jobs. It's like, you're confused. You have adopted a secular mindset. That's the mind of Adam talking. The mind of Christ can take two fish and five loaves and make it multiply. The mind of Christ doesn't see lack. The mind of Christ doesn't see scarcity. Anybody ever been to one of these like cookout celebrations, like a, a graduation party and, and too many people show up? So instead of self-serve, they get some people to serve the food? Come on. Just me? I'm the only one that's been to a ghetto cookout? <laughs> and you got Mama Susan back there scooping out the food? And she's scooping the food for you because she know this food could run out fast. Come on, that's a scarcity mindset. An abundance mindset says, let the wine run out. I'll take water and make it into wine. That's an abundance mindset. You know how hard it is for humans to move from a scarcity mindset into an abundance mindset? Very difficult because we naturally count stuff. And you think, these are cumulative, by the way. I hope you're realizing that. Very hard to have a faith mindset without a trust mindset. Very hard to have an abundance mindset without a faith mindset. Abundance says, okay, let me take you to, let me take you to Genesis. This, this is going to be good. Uh, uh, I think this is Genesis 33. I think this is Genesis 33. Um, now, I, I need you to remember the story, okay? Remember the story. There's two boys in the Bible, twins. Jacob and, okay, good. Y'all are Bible nerds. I love y'all. Jacob and, what, what are they fighting over? Birthright and then the blessing. Blessing. You know what's funny is that Jacob tricks Esau out of the blessing because Jacob has a what? A scarcity mindset. He believes there's only one. This is hard. This is human nature. One of something that was just made up. Let's think about this. It's a blessing. Jacob tricks his brother out of what? The blessing. Esau sells his birthright, but then Jacob tricks him out of the blessing. So now Jacob is what? Come on, don't think too hard. Blessed. Easy, right? Come on. Jacob is. But what does he beg the angel to do that he's wrestling? To bless him. Ain't it crazy how when you get the right thing the wrong way, you still want it? Oh. So Jacob is still saying, I will not let you go until you bless me, not realizing that he's already blessed. Because when you get the right thing at the wrong time and the wrong way, it's not even satisfying to you. You cannot turn a good thing into an idol. So now, Jacob is finally ready to reunite with his brother Esau. He's finally ready, and he sends a bunch of gifts to sugar him up, you know what I mean? To kind of coax him into not killing him, because the last time they saw one another, Esau vowed, next time I see you, I'm throwing hands. I'm going to wait for our parents to die. 
But once our parents die and I see you again, I'm going to kill you. Because what? You bought my, bless my birthright for me and tricked me out of my birthright. Now get this. They finally meet. And here's what Esau says. Esau asks, what's the meaning of all these flocks and herds that I met? Because Jacob had sent a bunch of flocks and herds ahead of him to, to butter him up. And here's what Esau says. Uh, Jacob responds and says, to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, he said. But Esau said, I already have plenty. You want to know what happens by the end of the story? Both brothers are blessed. Because there is no such thing as just enough for one person. You are not playing musical chairs with anything that God has for you. Come on, don't act. You never played musical chairs? Come on, five chairs, six people, and you got to bump somebody out of the way? The big old hip contest. Come on. How, come on, can we be honest? Can we be honest in church? How many people have felt like they've been playing musical chairs in their life? God's only got five blessings and there's six people, so you got to fight and you're crabs in a barrel and you got to compete. Can I tell you something? That's a scarcity mindset. That is a scarcity mindset. And our culture thrives on it. Capitalism thrives on it. Our secular culture thrives on it. We live, eat, and breathe a scarcity mindset culture. But we are called to be countercultural. We are called to be in the world, but not of the world. I reside in this world, but I'm not walking around with the mind of Adam. I have the mind of Christ. Nothing is going to convince me that there's not more than enough for me. I have an abundance mindset. There's more than Enough, more than, can I be vulnerable about this? One time I felt guilty. Me and my wife were struggling with infertility. And I want to know if anybody else has kind of felt guilty about praying for stuff because there was somebody at our church with cancer. And, and in my head, the lie of the enemy told me that my problem wasn't as important as their problem. Anybody else? So I felt guilty Asking God to bless me because really I should be focused on God blessing. And God had to tap me on the shoulder and be like, do you think I'm your broke uncle? Who do you think I am? <laughs> Who, what kind of little God have you made me into being? You think that what, I have to choose? You think what? I, I'm pulling from a box of miracles? And there's only 10 miracles in the box, and I'm only giving nine out today. That's what you think about me? I'm God, idiot. I am God. I can give you a baby, heal their cancer, feed people in third world countries. I can do everything. Are you concerned with how I'm holding up Saturn and Jupiter right now? No. But I'm doing that and regulating your heartbeat all at the same time because I'm not a God of limited supply. I'm a God of unlimited supply. More than enough. More than enough. Come on, abundance mindset. Here we go. What was that story last night? Jairus and the one with the issue of blood. Jairus is what? We got to get to the house, right? Because come on, the priority is his daughter. What does Jesus teach Jairus? I don't have to choose between this woman with the issue of blood and your daughter. I can heal the woman with the issue of blood and come resurrect your daughter because we're not playing musical chairs. I'm not a tiny little God. I am the God of the universe. I am more than enough. I can do everything. I can do all things. I'm not a human. Get me out of the human box that you've placed me in. Stop using human language to describe me. I am wholly other than you. W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy in every way. The whole totality of God is different than humans. There's nothing about him that's like you. Okay, come on, we got to move, come on. An abundance mindset. Uh, uh, yeah, the, an abundance mindset. 
Next, uh, an identity mindset. Identity. 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 Jesus is baptized. Dove ascends. And the dove says... Uh, oh, sorry, no. The dove lands on Jesus. God says, God the Father. I said that and immediately went, no, that's not right. The dove didn't say nothing. The dove lands on Jesus. God the Father cracks open the sky. And one version, and by one version, I mean one of the gospel writers says, this is my son who I'm well pleased. The other gospel writer says, you are my son who I'm well pleased. What does Jesus receive? Identity. What does the serpent or what does Satan immediately say right after God says those words? He gets into the wilderness. He's fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And guess what the, the Satan says? If you are the son of God, turn these stones into if you are the son of God. Because the enemy wasn't attacking his hunger. The enemy was attacking his identity. The, what the enemy was saying is this. <laughs> Come on. That didn't really happen. A dove? Really? You're the only one that heard it. God said you were a son? Okay, okay, okay. If, if, if God really said that, prove it. And you know who has to prove stuff? Insecure people. If Jesus had proved it, he would have only proven that he did not believe the identity that God was trying to give him. Identity. I got a, a, a picture for you when it comes to insecurity, okay? Because especially in youth ministry, uh, come on, all teenagers are a little insecure. That's why worship is so hard for y'all. Uh-oh. Because you don't want to lift your hands because you don't want to draw attention to yourself. You don't want to draw attention to yourself because really you're just insecure. Uh-oh. That's why you date stupid people. <laughs> it's just, it's just, you date stupid people because you want validation. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> you're not even dating them because you like them. You're just dating them because you're insecure. And you think that dating some 15-year-old that doesn't know how to properly apply deodorant <laughs> is going to increase your social status. Oh, boy. You want to know what's funny, though? It's a vicious cycle that the enemy keeps you trapped in. Because worship is the only thing that makes you truly confident. And the enemy knows if he can keep your hands down and your lips closed then you'll always be insecure because you'll always be thinking about yourself. Uh-oh. Because insecurity is inward driven. Okay, you ready? You ready? Insecurity has two fruits. Everybody say two fruits. Insecurity has two fruits. Insecurity is a root mindset. It produces two fruits. Ins come on, take notes. Insecurity is a what? Foundational mindset, and it produces two fruits. Here's the first fruit that insecurity produces. The first fruit that insecurity produces is low self-esteem. Because someone who's battling with low self-esteem is only focused on their weaknesses. It's an obsession with self. Here's the second fruit that is produced by insecurity. Arrogance. Arrogance and low self-esteem are not opposites. They're the flip side of the same coin. Low self-esteem is obsessed with self. Guess what arrogance is obsessed, obsessed with? Self. Low self-esteem is obsessed with your self's weaknesses. Arrogance is obsessed with your self's gifts. Both are obsessed with self. Did I lose you? You sure? Okay. What we typically teach is that low self-esteem and arrogance are different things. They're not different. They're two different symptoms of the same illness. Insecurity is the root problem. 
If you're insecure, it means you think you matter more than you do. Uh Uh-oh. Here we go. Let's go to Exodus. Is this helpful? Is this helpful? Let's go to Exodus. I'm going to give you a bunch of passages in Exodus because this is where God calls Moses. God what? Calls Moses. And Moses wants zero parts of this. Moses is what? Insecure. And here's what Moses says. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Now here's a trick. This sounds like humility. But this is low self-esteem. Oh boy, I'm going to say something that's going to make everybody a little uncomfortable. Low self-esteem is one of the one sins that we allow in church because it looks like humility. But low self-esteem is to deny the truth of what God says about you. To have a lower or higher opinion of yourself than what God says about you is rebellion against the fact that God has said something about you. Here we go. What else does Moses say? Just give me the next one. Moses answered, what if they do not believe? Come on, what if they don't believe? Or listen to? And say, the Lord did not appear to you. Next one, what, what's Moses' next excuse? Moses said to the Lord, pardon your. It's funny how he's not being a servant. Because <laughs> servants obey. <laughs> Moses calls himself a servant, but he keeps what? He can't get over his insecurities to actually obey what God is telling him to do. God is saying, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses keeps what? Making it about himself. What if they don't believe me? What if they don't listen to me? Me, 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 me. Because insecurity is selfishness in disguise. Oh, I'm coming for your life. (laughs) You think you're humble. You're not humble. You're selfish. You're self-centered. Every time you talk about your weaknesses, you don't realize you're talking about you. Uh Uh-oh. No one ever asked you about you. Here we go, here we go, here we go. I'm going to just keep on teaching the Bible. Come on. I have never been eloquent. (laughs) Neither in the past, nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. What does Moses say next? Because he just keeps on coming. Pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. I'm preaching to y'all. I'm preaching. <laughs> this sounds like a lot of us. Pastor Luke and Pastor Doc are like, we need more youth ministry volunteers. You're like, please send someone else. <laughs> okay, here we go. Here we go. Zach, if, if this was my friend, If Moses was my friend, this is going to reveal how flawed we are as humans. If Moses is my friend and he said all that to me, I'm not eloquent. You know, they're not going to listen to me. Who am I? He says all this insecure stuff. Come on, most of us would say, no, Moses, you're great. Are you kidding me? Moses, you're so gifted. Moses, you're amazing. Moses, you, you. You are eloquent. And even if you're not eloquent, Moses, at least you're handsome. You know? Come on, come on. Don't act like you've never had an insecure friend. And they said all this stuff. And what did you do? You encouraged them. You told them a bunch of good stuff about themselves. And you tried to put the right thoughts into someone's mind who was broken. You want to know what God's response is to this? Are you ready? Here's God's response. You're going to love this. I am that I am. I need you to, you're going to, you'll get it. God's response is not to affirm Moses. God's response is to tell Moses about himself. God's response is not to tell Moses, oh no, Moses, you're eloquent. It's okay. God doesn't give Moses a pep talk because this is not self-help. There we go. Come on. I'm trying to shift your mindset. 
You say, I'm not eloquent. You want to know what God says? It was never about you. Who made this about you? Who mentioned you? I am that I am. The only person who you need to be enamored with, focused on, meditating on, is God. But I ain't that cute. God, go, God doesn't even waste his time to say, yeah, you are pretty. No, no, because that's what we want. That's what we want. What we want is self-help. That's what we want. We want to go to a Tony Robbins conference. <laughs> Get professional development. The problem is that's the mind of Adam. The mind of Adam says, believe in yourself. The mind of Christ goes, who said you matter? I took uneducated fishermen and used them to turn the world upside down. What? I took a philandering, murdering king named David and used him to write most of the Psalms. What? Who said you mattered? You? Oh, get over yourself. Get over yourself. Well, I'm not equipped. Get over yourself. But I don't got enough money. Get over yourself. But I don't got the right education. I am that I am. But I'm really into I am that I am. Because remember, insecurity has what? The first fruit is low self-esteem, which is an obsession with self. The second fruit is arrogance, which is an obsession with self. Most of you are offended if I told you that your low self-esteem is arrogance in disguise. You'd say no, but I would tell you arrogance is an obsession with self. And if you keep talking about how you don't have it all together, I would say you sound like someone who's obsessed with yourself. And God's response to people who are obsessed with themselves is to tell them that I am that I am. You go in the name of Yahweh. You don't go in the name of Moses. No one asked you what Moses had. I'm telling you that Yahweh is the one that empowers you. Yahweh is the one who sends you. Yahweh is the one that anoints you. Yahweh is the one that equips you. Yahweh is the one that's going to split the Red Sea. Yahweh is the one that's going to send a plague of hail and a plague of frost. Yahweh is the one. That's just a, a stick, man. Are you kidding me? You think there's power in the stick? No. There's power in me and I told you to lift up the stick I can do what I want because I'm God notice I did not say move from an insecurity mindset to a confidence mindset confidence is just more mind of Adam we don't move from an insecurity mindset to a confidence mindset no we move from an insecurity mindset to a what identity mindset now here we go I feel like this is helpful. Like, I feel like your brain, I'm like shaking it a little. I'm making you think different. This is what I mean by not telling you what to think, but how. To, this is a new way of how to think. So, come on, you know how many Christians I've heard just spout confidence? And I went, <laughs> you don't even need Bible for that. This is a bunch of mine of Adam. Here we go. What is identity? Here's what the mind of Adam says about identity, that I have to go find it myself. So you hear people talk about, I've got to discover myself. <laughs> this is how you know you've been more influenced by your culture than by scripture. Because you start sounding like a product of culture, not a product of scripture. Here's what God says. You don't find identity. You receive it from me. Because there is no way to define the human apart from knowing who God is. 
And if you use your husband or your wife to define you, then you will always be dependent upon the confidence of that person or the approval of that person or the validation of that person. The problem with dating someone when you're still stuck in an insecurity mindset is that you need them in order to feel good about yourself. So people start saying things like, do I look cute in this outfit? Do you think you look cute? The only reason you're fishing for compliments, uh-oh. And we become, I'm talking to the married people, you think your spouse can do something for you that only God can. Give you identity. Identity is not found. It's received. And here we go. Because we first built a what? Mindset of trust. We trust that if God says something about us, that he's right. Because identity is not discovered. You don't need to go on some self-discovery adventure. I'm just finding myself. You ever wonder, the people who are off finding themselves never find anything. <laughs> They're off for a long time. Just, I'm just finding myself. <laughs> just discovering myself. Here we go. The first move is what? From, a, from distrust to trust. Or I would call from an independence mindset to a trust mindset. That instead of being independent from God, I want to what? Trust God. The next movement is we move into a faith mindset. The third movement is we move into what? An abundance mindset. Fourth, we move into what? An identity mindset. Now, I'll say this, you can write this down. All thoughts, all thoughts fall into three categories. Thoughts about God, thoughts about self, and then thoughts about others. So everything that we've touched on so far fall into the category of thoughts about God and thoughts about self. This last one, once you get your thoughts about God straight, you can finally get your thoughts about self straight. You cannot have the right thoughts about yourself until you first have the right thoughts about God. It's funny, I was, I was fussing at one of my youth leaders uh, back when I was doing youth ministry. I don't do youth ministry no more. Thank God. I've been delivered from Axe body spray. <laughs> from wavering hormone levels, I, I've been delivered from all of it, okay? <laughs> I was fussing at one of my youth leaders because when Jayon was a teenager, I had a group of them. Um, that I, they were my preaching cohort. Jayon, Jordan, Daniel Gwynn. I had a group of teenagers that I taught how to preach. Sometimes I wrote the sermons for them. <laughs> Jayon's like, yeah. <laughs> Jayon's preached a couple of sermons that I wrote for him because it's not youth ministry unless the youth are doing the ministry. They need to be actively involved. They're not there to spectate, they're there to participate. And yeah, I mean, I was a better preacher, but teenagers would come just to hear their friend preach. And so one of my youth leaders, you know, full grown adult, 30 something years old, said these words. I mean, I wish I had a youth pastor like you when I was a teenager, I'd probably be a pastor right now. And I said, so you think that God withheld something that you needed? What kind of jacked up thoughts about God do you have? You, you're telling me that the call of God to preach was on your life and you needed a youth pastor to develop you and God just didn't send one. Do you realize what that says about him? That would be, I would call that a bad father. But he's good, which means guess what? I almost said that dude's name. I'll make up another name. Here, easy. Guess what, Adam? If you had needed it, God would have sent it to you. The fact that you don't have it is actually proof that you didn't need it. I can feel the tension in the room. 
Because you want to know what so many of us have said? God didn't take care of me. God should have given me a different dad or a different mom or a different family or a different this or a different that. And guess what? God gave you everything you needed to be everything that God has actually called you to be. You don't need to be jealous of anybody. You don't need to be stuck in a scarcity mindset. It's a terrible mindset to live in. First, we have to fix the thoughts that we entertain about God. I need you to ask yourself the question, if what you're saying is true, what does that say about God? Does your mindset make God bigger or make God smaller? Make God holier or make God more human? What do your thoughts say about God? Because if he's actually the God of the Bible, oh, then it prompts us to what? Adopt a faith, a faith mindset, an abundance mindset. The, a trust mindset, a faith mindset, and an abundance mindset are all rooted in what you believe about God. An identity mindset is rooted in what you believe about yourself. But they're cumulative. You cannot get to the right thoughts about yourself until you first nail down the right thoughts about God. There's an A.W. Tozer quote. He's one of my favorite authors. Can we put it up there? An A.W. Tozer quote. I think there is. Maybe. It should be under uh, a trust mindset. It should be an A.W. Tozer quote. No. Oh, man. You didn't, say, you didn't do it? No? Okay. It's okay. <laughs> Jayon said, I'm sorry. Uh, there's an amazing book if you want a book recommendation. Knowledge of the Holy by A.W. Tozer. He says, a man or a woman can never ascend above what they believe about God. What the most important thing about any person are the thoughts that they entertain about God. By a secret law of the soul, you will either, you will secretly move towards your mental image of God. You think he's mean? Then you're going to grab fig leaves and cover yourselves and hide. You think he's full of grace? You will let him cover you with the skins of an animal. It's all about what you believe about him. And here we go, last mindset. A mindset of interconnectedness. Interconnectedness means this. That I'm not just an individual. But I am living an interconnected life in covenant community with God's church. And I, here's the two extremes. Our culture teaches us both. The first extreme is called, you can live independent from others. But we know that's not true, because God says to mourn with those who mourn, and to rejoice with those who rejoice. There's this weird theology that just says, you know, as long as you are good with God, you're fine. No, Adam was alone with God, and God said, this ain't good, and put another human on the planet. Love for God is proven by what? Love for others. Here's the other opposite secular mindset. Not just independence, but codependence. Where I need to be needed. God says, I don't want you to be independent of other humans. I don't want you to be codependent on other humans. Both of those are toxic. I need you to embrace that you are interdependent with other human beings. So yes, you can ask for prayer. And yes, you can live in community. Unless you need to be a part of a small group. And yes, you need a pastor. And yeah, you need people, but you can never have a healthy relationship with people if you entertain wrong thoughts about yourself and wrong thoughts about God. The only people that can actually walk in healthy relationship are people who have the right thoughts about God and the right thoughts about self. You know what that makes you? It's the biggest gift you can give. It makes you an emotionally inexpensive person to be in a relationship with. I'll say that again. When you have the right thoughts about God and the right thoughts about self, it makes you an emotionally inexpensive person to be in relationship with. Emotionally inexpensive. You want to know one of the most aggravating things? It's to be in a relationship with someone who is emotionally expensive. Woo! Emotionally expensive. Oh, okay, you need, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an easier word. 
needy. <laughs> needy. Need, they need compliments. They always need you to call them. They never call you. It's a one-way street. Healthy relationships are reciprocal. Reciprocity is the fruit of a healthy relationship. If a relationship is not reciprocal, then it is doomed to fail. You can only have a reciprocal relationship when you are what? Secure, whole, and you have moved into an identity mindset, and you can only have that when you what? Know who God is. When you have all five of those mindsets, oh, that's the mind of Christ. Because Jesus doesn't let anybody pressure him into doing anything. You know, Mary and Martha, they try to guilt trip Jesus. Had you been here, Jesus is like, nah, you ain't guilt tripping me. So I got boundaries. So I'm a healthy person. But you the savior of the world. Yeah, but I'm not here for you to run me ragged. Nope. I know my father's will. I know who I am. And I've got boundaries. Anyone who's guilty about putting boundaries up with family and friends, can I help you? Jesus had boundaries. And you're not better than Jesus. I'm assuming that you didn't need that last part, but let me just say it just in case. Just helpful tonight. Just helpful, just helpful, just helpful. Let me know if this is helpful. Okay. Just want show of hands. Come on, who's in the room? And you're at my thoughts about God need to change. Come on. That's all of us, really, but you know, I'm not gonna pressure you to put your hand up. Come on, my thoughts about God need to change. The version of God that I currently believe in is too little, too weak. Idolatry is not just to worship things that aren't God. Idolatry is also to make God in our image. Ooh. The golden calf, remember that in Exodus? What do they say? These are the gods that brought us what? Out of Egypt. They weren't creating a, a different God. They were trying to worship the right God the wrong way. They were trying to make God into an idol, a graven image that they could understand. Trying to make God into something you can understand, me, okay, okay. Anything you can understand, you can control. If I become an expert at cars, I'm, I become a, there's a lot of Dodge Rams I've seen in Iowa. If I become a Dodge Ram expert, guess what? I can control it. You know what one, one of us, some of us want? We want to become a God expert so we can control him. And God says, the reason you worship me is actually because you cannot even control. You can't understand me. If you could understand me, it'd be proof that I wasn't God. Come on, whose God needs to be bigger? God, I need you to be bigger. I've limited you. I've put you in a box. God, we repent. Come on, God, we repent. Can we stand all over the place? Come on, God, we repent. God, we repent. We repent. We may not be guilty of worshiping an idol, but we've been guilty of using very small terms to describe you, which means we're not worshiping you for who you actually are. God, we declare tonight, like David, we will what? Magnify the Lord. Can David actually make God bigger? No, but he's saying, I'm making my perspective of God bigger. So God, we magnify you tonight. Come on, with hands lifted in the room. God, we magnify you. We just want to make you bigger than you've been. Whatever box we've put you in, God, we're sorry. Here we go. Wave at me if you need to fix your thoughts about yourself. Come on. You need to fix your thoughts about yourself. You've been dealing with thoughts of comparison, envy, jealousy. 
and you say things about yourself that don't honor God. Can I tell you something? Every time you talk negatively about yourself or think negatively about yourself, you're thinking wrong about God's creation. You don't belong to you. You belong to a creator. You are made in his image. He made no mistakes. When you look at the sky, it's evidence that God is an artist. When we look at creation, it's evidence that God is an artist. The stars and evidence that God is an artist and humans are his greatest piece of work. This is just a word of knowledge really quick. For some of us, we struggle to love ourselves because you're, you actually are battling with unforgiveness towards a parent. And when you look at yourself, you see them. And until you forgive them, you're never gonna love you. If there's anybody in the room and you know that's true, I don't know who that's for, just wave at me. I wanna know who I'm talking to. Really, your, your, your thoughts of insecurity stem from the fact that you're resentful that God gave you the parents he gave you. Can I tell you something? Let it go so that you can finally accept who God had created you to be. And then next, come on. Who needs to have different thoughts about others? Different thoughts about others. I've been walking in relationship. My relationships are marked by insecurity and neediness. Come on, it doesn't matter which mindset you need to adopt. Let's lift up our hands. Come on, let's worship. God, I ask that you would change mindsets tonight. God, don't just give us new thoughts. We don't want to put new wine into old wineskins. God, we ask that you would give us brand, a brand new mind. God, we ask that our minds would be instruments of righteousness for you. We declare that our minds are going to become the greatest tool that we have for the upbuilding of your kingdom. God, we declare right now, there's books in you. Come on, there are songs in you. And the moment you begin to take control over the tool that God has given you, God's gonna use the work of your hands to advance his kingdom. We declare that there is greatness on the inside of you. You've gotta get over some mental hurdles so that you can be everything that God's ever called you to be. God, we thank you. Come on, you're in the room. You're in the place. Come on, God, we magnify your name.